Maybe there's a new litter of raccoons in your garage, or a scratching noise in the ceiling that makes you think squirrels. How about an all-consuming confrontation with a skunk? In cities and towns across Ontario, people and wild animals interact whether they want to or not. New York opted to hire a rat czar to oversee their biggest problem. Does something similar make sense for the critters we see in our cities here? Let's ask Natalie Carvonen, director of the Toronto Wildlife Centre, and Brad Gates, owner and president of Gates Wildlife Control. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Now, to get us started, let's get a sense of a typical day at the office uh, for, for both of you. This is actually a video of Brad Gates on the job with his colleague and some uninvited attic dwellers. Let's have a look. Thank you for being quiet. Being quiet, buddy. Good boy. All right, so I can guarantee that the control room was doing a bunch of awes because that was very cute. <laughs> yeah. What's important to take note in that video is that you are reuniting the babies with the mother. What you probably didn't see there was the mother was on the other side of the fence. Yes. Uh, tell us about your methods. We want to make clear that your business is wildlife control, not extermination. Your company's slogan is the animal's choice Correct. since 1984. So tell us a little bit about the distinction. Correct. So when I started my business in 84, the most common way of removing wildlife was to set a live trap, catch it, and take it many miles away and release it. And I knew there had to be a better way. So what we started to do is finding methods to keep the family unit together, keep them in an area that they're familiar with where they can find their food and find additional shelter. And we, over the years, have we haven't perfected it because we're always learning on how to do things better, but I think we've, we're well on our way to using the animal's biology and behavior to help them get their babies back, relocate their young, and continue to live in an area that they're familiar with. All right. Full disclosure, Natalie, I was chatting with you off camera that I spent a summer volunteering uh, at the Toronto Life Centre, working like, with the, the Squirrel Nursery, where a lot of volunteers uh, got their first start. But for audience, for our audience, tell us sort of the work that the Toronto Wildlife Centre does, and how is it different from what Brad does? Well, uh, we are the busiest wildlife centre in the country, so it would take quite a long time to explain all the things that we do. but. Uh, I guess to, to the point of this program, uh, we have a wildlife hospital, which is very busy. We admit about 6,000 wild animals a year that are sick, injured, or orphaned. Um, with regards to the orphans, I mean, we've known uh, Brad's company for a long time because we, we do consider their work to be very uh, responsible and humane. And there's very little licensing for wildlife removal companies out there. So a lot of really crappy companies are generating a lot of work for us. Hmm. So each year um, we get requests to take so many babies that are I guess orphaned in the sense, I put use quotation marks because they probably still have a mother, but their mother has probably been trapped and taken away and dumped somewhere now. Yeah. Uh, and all those babies are left behind. And, and sometimes it's even homeowners who don't know any better and they have a trap, they don't realize it's a female with babies. They say, oh, there's a lovely forest on the way to my cottage. They drop her off, she's probably not gonna live. Uh, and then a few days later, they're screaming babies and they yeah. have to call us. So, so we're dealing with, um, in addition to the orphans, sick and injured wild animals, uh, and about 300 different species. There's a huge diversity of wildlife in the Toronto area. Give me, give me a range of what type of animals you're dealing with. Many, many species of owls, many species of hawks, many species of bats, a, a, amazingly huge diversity of songbirds. There's deer, beavers, mink, uh, weasels, rabbits, opossums, so just a, a, a lot of waterfowl, like um, swans and grebes and loons, just a huge diversity of wildlife. All here in the city. Yeah. All in the city, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this city has an amazing amount of green space and a lot of natural areas, which is something that I think many of us really love about Toronto and surrounding areas. And we put a lot of resources into that, but it causes a lot of problems because yeah. it means that wild animals are living in very close proximity to things that are not only a danger to them, but can be a frustration to people as well. All right. Um, we're not going to talk extensively about rats or mice, but I do want to talk about this um, just because, as we said off the top, New York just appointed a rat czar to help bring down uh, the population of rats. 
Does Toronto or Ontario's urban centers need something like that for rats and mice? Do we have a problem like, like New York does? Not like New York. Um, I think New York is probably one of the filthiest cities <laughs> in North America, and that is why they have such a problem. There's so, so much access to food and shelter that their numbers just explode. I think Toronto is on its way to doing a, a pretty good job at controlling um, some of the mice and rats uh, in, in our inner city. Um, and they've done that by, just recently on April 1st, they introduced the no feeding wildlife bylaw, which is great because you're not introducing wildlife to people. And so we are different. We, we should keep our distance from one another. Um, also, the city has um, bylaws on um, property standards where we have to keep our, our backyards and our properties in, in decent repair so that animals aren't attracted and wanting to break in. Um, and just the green bin in itself keeps the food waste that we produce away from these critters so that they're not, uh, not again, multiplying quickly. All right, we'll get back to that bylaw because I definitely have some questions there. Uh, so, Natalie, it, it's good. We don't, it doesn't seem like we have a rat problem, at least to the extent, uh, to the, if we compare it to New York. But I'm curious, what creature is Toronto's number one mm -hmm. wildlife challenge? Mm. Well, it depends on which direction you're approaching mm. it from and who you ask. I think, I mean, uh, some people might say raccoons, you mm. know, because they get into garbages or, or roofs or things like that. Some people uh, might, if they're in parks, they might say Canada geese because they poop a lot <laughs> along the shoreline. That's often when people are feeding them, though. Right. Uh, some people might say coyotes, you know, if they're worried about their cat who shouldn't be outside free roaming. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> uh, or their small dog. Um, so I think it depends a little bit on, on who you ask. I'm going to stick with the raccoons um, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of work has been done to sort of <clears throat> get raccoons out of our garbage and, and such. What is the best way to deal with them? Um, and I, I'm assuming a raccoon czar is not uh, needed in, in terms of that. But I think when people think of urban centers in Ontario, particularly Toronto, we see a raccoon. Uh, that's sort of the image that a lot of people uh, see. What is the best way to sort of, and I, I don't want to say deal with them because, yeah. hey, th th we're in their backyard just as much as they are in our backyard. So We need a human czar. Uh, so in, in my opinion, uh, it really comes down to human behavior. Um, we have a very, very busy wildlife hotline at Toronto Wildlife Centre. I, I think it's the busiest one in North America. We get a crazy number of phone calls about all manner of wildlife issues. I took a call once years ago, which is indicative of the problem. It was a woman who had spent the last three months teaching her local raccoon, who she had named Bandit or Rocky or whatever it was at the time, to open her kitchen door, come into her kitchen and take food from her mouth. Mm. And she thought this was a great achievement. <laughs> um, and her neighbors were horrified. You know, this raccoon knows how to actually open the screen doors to their houses. But so many people feed raccoons uh, and so many people feed other wild animals. Uh, people put food out for their pets who, again, shouldn't be outdoors unsupervised, but the raccoons get into that. Um, and I agree with Brad that green bins are a great step forward. But if you go places like the Danforth, every, every restaurant and variety store has an overflowing dumpster behind it with all kinds of food scraps and the raccoons are like, woo, and there's mm -hmm. 20 raccoons every night feeding from there. So I think first and foremost, we have to look at human behavior. Um, I always talk about my cottage, which is in a very remote area, and the only time we see raccoons is on our trail camera, which is the motion activated camera, mm -hmm. because we don't feed them. There's a provincial park there and they just, they're normal raccoons. Um, but in the city, we effectively train them to behave badly. What do you say normal raccoon. <laughs> what does that actually mean? I think like for people who live in the urban center, a normal raccoon is one that's crawling on our green bin and yeah. you know, sort of walking the sidewalks uh, and, and sort of scaring people or, or you know, I had a, I had a run in with a, a, a raccoon not that long ago. I was like, oh, but a normal <laughs> one is what? Scavenging on its own on a trail. <laughs> A normal wild animal should not be anywhere near people. A normal wild animal should be afraid of people, uh, should be not see people as a food source, shouldn't see, you know, Brad and say, hey, you might give me a sandwich. I'm gonna go yeah. up to this guy and see what exactly. happens. Um, so if, if they're left to their own devices in a truly wild setting, they would just be going about their business, eating berries and turning over logs and looking for earthworms and fishing for crayfish along the water. And, and if they saw a person, I do see a raccoon up there maybe once every five years, and then they go, ah, they run into the forest. That's mm -hmm. what a normal raccoon or any other normal wild animal should do. All right, so uh, Brad, as Natalie was saying, some people welcome 
these animals into yes. their homes uh, yes. openly. Sometimes they get in in different ways. Now we do have some items here. Tell us what we are looking at. We'll bring this up on the camera. So this is a vent that exists on every home in Toronto. And roofers have gone away from the metal vents that were more formidable to keep animals out of the attic, but they could still get in through the metal ones, but not nearly to the numbers that we're seeing the plastic vent. And this would be on the roof, right? This is on the roof. It allows the hot air in the attic to escape during the summer months so that moisture doesn't build up. And you can see here that a squirrel has easily, and probably in less than two minutes, chewed the face of this vent off. <laughs> and then once inside underneath the cover, they can get into the attic itself. But raccoons simply peel this lid completely off, and they have this nice square opening that leads directly into the attic space. And this is where they go to feel protected, raise their family, um, and just stay warm during the winter months. All right, let's talk solution. Very easy, because this is what you yes. have. Tell us. Exactly. So anytime we do a wildlife removal from a home, we highly recommend that homeowners put these cages on top of the vent. That way the animals cannot get to the vent and manipulate it and th therefore then cannot get into the attic. At the end of the day, it starts really with this because you were saying this used to be made differently. Yes, it was made of metal, um, hard, much harder for an animal to chew on or even manipulate, uh, but the plastic roofers have done um, a, a, a service to us in the sense that we are now doing more work because <laughs> of them using plastic roof fence. All right, very good. Natalie, I want to come to you. Uh, as, as Brad had mentioned, on April 1st, the city of Toronto passed the bylaw to make it illegal to feed urban wildlife. Uh, songbirds, of course, are exempt from that. Why is this important? Well, I mean, as I mentioned before, like one of the animals that someone might call a challenge is a, is a coyote. Um, but even talking about raccoons as we have been, if you, if you feed wild animals, then a, a couple of things can happen. First of all, you can change their behaviors because they now see people as, as good. They see people as someone to go to for food. And people don't like coyotes running up to them or their kids wondering if they've got a handout for those animals. Um, it, it's, I don't think coyotes are something really to be afraid of. They're a 30 pound animal. If I have to handle one, I drop a tea towel over their head and just hold their mouth shut. It's not a grizzly bear, but you know, they still do evoke this feeling of the big bad wolf and people are nervous you know, if, if a coyote will just walk right up to somebody. And similarly with raccoons or squirrels, um, other animals will also lose their fear of people like pigeons or geese. People don't tend to be afraid of them, but they more complain about the poop. So um, those things are all not great things. But for some animals, like pigeons and raccoons, if you feed them enough, you actually increase their numbers. Um, because the amount of animals in an area will be dictated by food, water, and shelter in the area. Mm -hmm. And if they have abundant food, then instead of having four babies that year, maybe they'll have five babies or even six babies mm -hmm. because there's just a plethora of food and they can actually have more babies. So in urban areas, raccoons are actually at a higher density than out in Algonquin Park or something like that because it's a great place for them to live. There's mm. lots of food. Um, I want to talk a little bit on the education side of feeding because I think some people, and you've talked about this, we know where you stand on cats, outdoor cats, and I understand why. There are people, and I, I don't want to put my best friend on blast, <laughs> but uh, cat colonies. These are, you know, lots of people think they're doing a lot of help putting out food for cats and, and thinking that, you know, this poor little animal doesn't have food, I need to feed it, I need to, you know, one said friend has it on a timer and has all this stuff ready to go, but also mm. attracts all of these other animals like mm. possums, skunks, and raccoons. How do you balance that education where people think that they're doing good, but ultimately it is this reoccurring problem? Yeah, I mean, you re it really comes down to um, talking through sort of the, the fundamentals and the biology of what's happening with the people. You know, as I mentioned, you talking about the fact that you're changing behaviors and elevating populations. I mean, generally, in all the years we've been doing this, you know, I've never met a mean person who feeds wildlife, you know, mm -hmm. or who feeds feral cats. It's all coming from a good place. You know, so it's just trying to talk to those people and, and get them to understand that they, are, they may actually be be doing a disservice to the animal. So if it's a wild animal that they want to feed, if they desperately want to feed them, you know, then we will say, if it's songbirds, you know, plant berry bushes, you know, in your area or natural food sources for those animals. Mm -hmm. um, the feral cat, feral cat colonies to me are, I mean, they're not wildlife, you know, they're domestic animals, but 
that's a really, really complicated uh, issue that would probably require a whole show in itself. Oh, I, I'm a huge cat lover myself. Um, I worry about feral cats being just left out there. The feral cats themselves um, are subject to so many diseases and being hit by cars. I remember seeing one in the annex, the blur annex when I used to live there that had a dangling broken back leg and, mm. and you couldn't get near him. He was getting just running away from you with this dangling, I'm sure, incredibly painful broken mm. legs. So it's a hard life for them out there. Yeah. Um, but then they, in turn, um, have a, an enormous impact on songbird and small mammal populations. So it's a complicated issue. Very sure. complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, apart from denying food sources to wildlife, uh, what else should, you know, city slickers be doing to prevent damage not only to themselves, their homes, or their pets? Well, wildlife populations grow or expand depending on the amount of uh, food and shelter that's available, as Natalie mentioned. So if you can control the food aspect, the next thing to control would be shelter. Now, there are a lot of older buildings in Toronto, and I don't think you could button up every house mm -hmm. so that an animal will not get in. What most animals look for is an opening about an inch by an inch, and if they can get their nose into that space, they can expand chewing on the wood or tearing with their claws, they can expand that opening big enough for them to get their body in. So homeowners, if they're looking not to ever have a wildlife problem, they should install the screens we just showed on the roof fence. They should cap their chimneys and have the house regularly inspected to make sure there aren't any openings or that a storm hasn't taken shingles off that eventually could cause an animal to be interested in moving in. Because correct me if I'm, if I'm right, right here, about 60% of your calls have to do with sort of the roof. Correct. Correct. Okay, that's a big yes. number. Um, is it ever a good idea? I think I know the answer that you're going to give me. Is it ever a good idea to poison urban wildlife? Never. Um, and this is, it's been the primary means of controlling rats and, and mice. You can almost see it on the outside of every commercial building in Toronto, these black boxes that have poison inside them. Um, and Natalie knows this all too well um, because animals show up at her shelter all the time that have been secondarily poisoned, so, and it can even affect the domestic. What do we mean by secondarily poisoned? So poison? when a rat or mouse gets poisoned, it's a slow death, it's a terrible death for them, and they often will wander outside. So now you have this animal that has succumbed to poison, might be barely alive or maybe already dead, but even a cat or a dog that, you know, may be at the house in question, goes outside and eats this, they can then get the poison into their system. But we probably see it more with wildlife species, yeah. where a, a raccoon or even bird of prey. Possums. Yeah. All kinds of animals will eat readily available dead or dying animals. And so yeah, poison should not be used. What control. is then, say with mice and, and, and rats, what is the best way? Um, I guess the, the alternative to that would be a snap trap type of, of a trap that causes instant death. Like death. Um, but yeah, that's basically, uh, the only really alternative to poison is to, to use one of those. All right. But, but fundamentally, if you don't change the food, water, and shelter available for mice and rats either, then you will always have True. lots of mice and rats in that area. So really, 100%. it's it's like, as, as Brad's been saying too, it's looking at you know food, it's looking at shelter. Why are there so many mice and rats in that area? And trying to identify the fundamental problem and deal with that. Otherwise, you're just doing cruel things to animals who feel pain, just like your dog or cat does. Uh, in perpetuity and not really solving the problem. Exactly. Right. Natalie, I'm going to come to both of you for this one, but uh, Natalie, will start with you. How can urbanites subscribe to the philosophy that, you know, let's all get along, living alongside and, and with wildlife, when some people will say that, you know, some of these are quite dangerous in terms of, you know, raccoons can harbor disease, skunks can harm our pets with their spray. You talked about coyotes and, and, and sort of people thinking that their small dogs are for dinner. So how do you, how do you balance that conversation and get people to, to buy into the philosophy, Natalie? Yeah, well, raccoons harbor no diseases that people can get. Um, the only possible one for discussion might be rabies, yes. but almost all of our raccoons in Southern Ontario are vaccinated against rabies now. Um, through a program that Ministry of Natural Resources has been running. So... How about the one, distemper? Is that something people for... People don't get distemper. Uh, raccoons got it from dogs. You know, we do a lot of disservices to wildlife, uh, but people cannot get distemper. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's a... I feel like some people feel a little bit entitled nowadays that they just don't want to be inconvenienced by anything, you know, <laughs> which is a bit of a broader <laughs> statement. Um, but I think that most people, though, when you talk to them 
uh, about the fact that, you know, we all love living in cities that have an abundance of nature and beautiful green spaces. You love to go for a walk in the ravine, that kind of thing. Then we can't pick and choose the wild animals who live in those areas. So if an animal bothers you or you're afraid of an animal, then we just encourage people to learn about that animal. Um, I, I've been working with wildlife my whole life and I am not afraid of any wild animal. I will walk happily in a ravine system here. There's no wild animal that I'm concerned about. Right. You know, maybe if I encountered a short-tailed shrew and I had to grab him with my hands, it's our only <laughs> venomous, you know, little know. mammal that we've got here. Um, but I think when people actually take the time to learn about them, it usually brings that whole stress and fear right down. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of calls we get on our hotline about snakes, for example. Mm. And we have a lot of people in the Toronto area who come from countries that have dangerous snakes. We don't have dangerous snakes in Southern Ontario. Um, if you go further north, there's one snake that is poisonous, but it's a, it's a species at risk and you're very like unlikely to encounter it. So we get calls about people who are hiding behind their couch and they've got the windows boarded up because they've seen a garter snake. Mm. And all we really need to do is spend five minutes talking to them about the fact that it's a completely harmless animal and they feel better about it. Brad. Education is key. I totally agree with everything Natalie said. Um, part of our job in removing wildlife is our, the homeowners that call us uh, are sleep deprived. Um, they're afraid that the animal's gonna drop through the ceiling and attack their family. So we need to convey to them that that's not reality. And how we do that, often we get the call, they don't care what we do to the animals as long as they can get back to sleep and they no longer hear this noise in the house. When we go up in the attic and we remove the babies that you saw in the video and we go down into the house, we take a moment to show them the babies. And they do a complete 180 in their thinking <laughs> that they wanted the animals killed. The next words out of their mouth are, you're not gonna hurt them, are you? So one customer at a time, we're educating them that wildlife are not dangerous and we should learn to coexist. And through screening the roof fence and protecting their house, they can have a long-term solution and not experience a wildlife problem ever again. What do you say then to some of the people who are, you know, upset that their garden is being chewed up, who have to pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars to fix their, their roofs, who see it as an inconvenience, but there's some, there's dollars behind that, uh, that, you know, they may, may not have. The problem was, I guess if you have a leak in your roof, um, the problem is that you didn't take care of your roof. So if you have a raccoon or a squirrel that's moved into your house, the problem is you didn't take the necessary measures to keep it out. So it really comes back down to, as Natalie was alluding to, it's people behavior. Um, you need to maintain your house. You need to, you're living in an urban environment where there's lots of wildlife and they all see your house as a potential den site. You need to take the measures one way or the other to prevent that from ever happening. And people see, people don't seem to feel if there's a really strong wind that blows shingles off their roof or that maybe knocks a branch onto their roof and they have to incur costs because of those things. People don't seem to have the same reaction as, as if it's a wild Very animal true. who does it. You know, they, if, if they don't call their counselor and say, ah, the wind <laughs> damaged my house, and now I have to pay $200. Yeah. But they will do that if a squirrel did it, you know, which is, you know, to us anyways, it's really just all part of nature. And um, as Brad says, you know, maintaining your property, it's all part of the same package. Well, my last question to you, Natalie, how much of this is actually, when we talk about green space and we talk about sort of cohabitating as, as one with urban wildlife, how much of this has to be sort of seen and done from a, a planning perspective? None of us are really planners, but how much of this needs to be seen from that, from that set and, and kind of moving forward? Like urban planners, mm -hmm. you mean? Oh my goodness, I would love it if urban planners would have even one person on their team who was a wildlife expert. The, the last, in, in less than, I think it's about three weeks now, our rescue team um, manager just told me yesterday, we've actually rescued about 500 duck and goose families off green roofs in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can manage. Like they are literally going with their hair on fire all day long from green roof to green roof to green roof because nobody uh, really thought about the fact that we actually, it's mandatory now to put green roofs in new construction. They don't realize that ducks and geese see that as a potential place to have their babies. And then the ducklings hatch, they have 20 story drop to the ground because they can no longer just walk <laughs> off the roof. Um, off leash areas uh, that for dogs that are put right next to coyote habitats, right. you know, glass buildings on migratory flyways. There's so many things we could do with better urban planning. All right, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to leave it there. Natalie, Brad, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.